the U.S. Ranger battalions that got wiped out at Cisterna, Italy in World War II. They could scale cliff walls, ambush the enemy in the dead of night, survive for weeks behind enemy lines, and were specially trained to be among the toughest, most resourceful soldiers in World War II. When there was a special mission regular infantry couldn't do, they would be called in. They were the U.S. Army Rangers. These elite units were the precursor of the Special Forces. They were the best combat soldiers on the American side during the Second World War. But during a disastrous campaign in Italy, a misfire in battle planning caused two entire battalions to walk straight into a trap. The idea behind the Ranger forces began when British Prime Minister Winston Churchill saw the need for a unit that could take on special operations. Activated in 1940, these soldiers were given the toughest training possible and sent on raids behind enemy lines in the dead of night. They were known as the Commandos. Naturally, when the U.S. Army commanders saw this, they wanted to build an elite unit of their own. They selected their best men and put them through grueling training in Scotland under the guidance of British commandos. Those who passed formed the 1st Ranger Battalion. Classified as light infantry, the Rangers operated in small units and carried as few weapons as possible. Instead, they relied on stealth, speed, and resourcefulness to do the job. The 1st Ranger Battalion took part in the bloody battles in North Africa, Sicily, and Southern Italy. But instead of the stealth missions they were trained for, the Rangers had to fight on the front lines like regular infantry. Even with their expertise, their lack of equipment was no match for heavy artillery and armored tanks. By the time the Allied army had swept halfway up the Italian peninsula, many of the Rangers had fallen prey to enemy fire. The remaining members were reshuffled into three battalions and put in charge of training new recruits to fill their ranks. Unfortunately, they did not have enough time and resources to train the newcomers to the same standards. This would become their biggest challenge in their next mission, Operation Shingle. An elaborate diversion. The goal of Operation Shingle was to land at the port of Anzio, then march inland to attack German forces north of the heavily fortified Gustav Line. U.S. forces positioned at the south of this line had already spent months trying to breach the formidable German defenses, but reinforced barriers and pillboxes built into the mountains made this nearly impossible. The new force in the north would be a diversionary tactic to lure enemy forces away from the Gustav Line. With the attention of the Germans split between two fronts, there would be a much bigger chance for the units further south to finally achieve a breakthrough. For the plan to succeed, they would need the Rangers. Three Army Ranger battalions, plus a chemical mortar battalion, a parachute infantry battalion, and an engineer brigade, formed the 6615th Provisional Ranger Force under the command of William Darby. To prepare for the amphibious assault, rehearsals were held at the Pozzuoli Bay on January 17th, just five days before the Anzio landing. There, the Ranger battalions ran into one problem after another. The landing craft stayed too close together, making it easier for the enemy to fire at them. Too many reached the beach at the same time, stacking up and delaying the advance. The newer rangers were too loud during stealth missions and didn't know how to time their movements to make sure their cover wasn't blown. Some groups set up defensive positions in the wrong locations and failed to scout the area in advance before proceeding to their targets. Even communicating with headquarters was an issue. With the best men gone and replacements not up to par, it was obvious that they were not ready for their mission. But with just five days to go before the landings, there was no more time for additional training. They would just have to hope the element of surprise would be enough to compensate for their lack of skill. The Beachhead in Anzio The first waves of landing craft reached the shores of Anzio on the morning of January 22, 1944. Their objective was to capture the port, destroy the gun batteries nearby, set up a beachhead between Anzio and the nearby town of Netuno, link up with other divisions, and fight their way inland. The plan was to launch a full-scale offensive when the Germans were least expecting it. When the Allied forces landed in Anzio, barely any coastal artillery or planes were defending the area. 
The enemy forces present were nothing but two weakened battalions, resting from months of fighting in the Gustav Line. In no time at all, the Allies secured the port and captured 227 prisoners. But instead of pressing forward to seize their other objectives as soon as possible, they spent the first few days preparing for a German counterattack. The man directly in charge of the operation, 6th Corps Commander Major General Lucas, had experienced powerful counteroffensives all the way from the Salerno landing to stalemate at the Gustav Line. Many of their units had not yet arrived at the beach, and with the lack of forces, General Lucas decided not to risk an attack until they were at full strength. This turned out to be a fatal mistake. Unlike the Americans and British who remained confined to the beachhead and did not even venture into nearby hilly terrain, the Germans saw the need to move fast. German Field Marshal Albert Kesselring immediately mobilized forces from the north and sent them towards the beachhead as soon as possible. By the time the Allies made their first move, they had already lost their window of opportunity. Once again, the Germans would have the upper hand. The Failed Ranger Mission just before midnight on January 30th, the rangers were sent to capture the town of Cisterna and cut off communication and supply lines with Rome. The town seemed like the ideal target for two reasons. One, because of its proximity to Route No. 7, one of the two major highways linking the Gustav Line in the south with the capital city of Rome in the north. Second, the German defenses in the Cisterna looked too weak to put up much resistance. There were no soldiers regularly patrolling the area, and according to intelligence reports, the Germans were far behind the town, not within it. Little did they know that the enemy was already busy laying a trap. The 1st and 3rd Battalions were to go one after the other, secure the town, and destroy machine gun batteries nearby. After capturing Cisterna, they would occupy areas northeast and northwest of the town. One hour later, the 4th Battalion would seize the Concla Isola Bella Cisterna Road, clearing mines and knocking out enemy forces. Once the area was under their control, the rest of the army would advance. At first, everything went according to plan. The first two battalions commenced their mission, and Colonel Darby set up his command outpost. But at around 3 a.m., four radio operators from the 3rd Battalion were lost. The 1st and 3rd Battalions lost contact with each other, and the 1st Battalion got split in two. To make things worse, the 3rd Battalion commander was killed by a tank. Despite the setbacks, half of the 1st Battalion advanced toward the town through the Mussolini Canal, killing German guards under the cover of darkness. At the end of the canal was a triangular field, where they would be vulnerable to attack when the sun came up. It was there that their biggest nightmare came true. As the separated forces caught up with each other, they found themselves surrounded by enemy tanks. Finally, it dawned on them. They had walked straight into a trap. But how did this happen? Let's go back for a moment. Remember that during the rehearsal, one of the Rangers' biggest problems was their poor mastery of stealth? That was the same thing that happened here. Even before they reached the town, they had already been spotted. This wasn't a coincidence. In the weeks since the landing at Anzio, German Field Marshal Kesselring had already been anticipating an attack on Cisterna. He wasted no time moving his units into the area and managed to do this without alerting Allied intelligence. When the Rangers set out to capture Cisterna, no one expected to encounter an elite panzer division and a parachute infantry battalion on the way. Before they knew it, they were cornered on all sides. For two straight hours, they defended an area 300 yards wide as their ammunition slowly ran out. They kept radioing headquarters for help, but none came. Colonel Darby and the 4th Battalion were busy facing off against a solid defense of German forces on the road. No matter how hard they tried, they simply could not break through to reach their trapped comrades. As the day went on, more German forces arrived at the battle scene. They took some rangers hostage and paraded them in front of their tanks to where the 1st and 3rd Battalions were concentrated. The order was clear, surrender or lose your comrades. When some of the rangers opened fire, the enemy retaliated by killing their captives. Twice, the rangers shot at the Germans. The third time, they accidentally killed their fellow Americans. Under the looming threat of flak guns and heavy artillery with dwindling ammunition and no outside help, the newer recruits began to buckle under pressure. 
Some dived in an irrigation ditch for cover as enemy tanks broke through their defenses, scattering them into smaller groups and pounding them with relentless gunfire. More and more rangers gave up their weapons until finally, the last of them surrendered. Out of the 767 rangers of the 1st and 3rd battalions, only six managed to escape. With two battalions wiped out in one day, the 66th 15th Ranger Force was no more. Sadly, the disaster could have been prevented if Allied intelligence had only been more efficient. A Polish defector had tried to warn them about the ambush, but the information didn't reach the higher-ups until the battle's aftermath. And there had already been signs of an elite paratrooper division in the area, yet the mission commanders did not factor this in their plans. Also, if the Allied forces had been more aggressive from the start, they might have been able to capture the city before German reinforcements arrived. Regardless of who was ultimately at fault, the Battle of Cisterna was a complete failure, paid for by the lives and liberty of the U.S. Army Rangers. <laughs>